Thank you for the introduction. So, as it has been said, I'm the CTO of Satoshi Labs, which is a company that brought you Trezor. Uh, we've been doing Trezor since 2012, so it's quite a long going effort now when it comes to compare to other Bitcoin uh, or cryptocurrency projects. But this talk will be not about Trezor like it usually is, but it will be about crypto space in general and what to do and what not, not to do. So uh, my talk is called security or slash insecurity of crypto space. And uh, security of data has never been more important. Uh, when uh, you lost some data like 20 years ago, it was usually some photos from vacation. Uh, it was sad, but it was not fatal. Uh, today, usually uh, when uh, you lose some data or, or somebody stalls your data, when it comes to the data related to crypto space, this is fatal. You don't have access to your money or somebody else has uh, already stolen them. So uh, there are various threats and of course there are various methods have to avoid these threats and uh, we will go through these types and uh, hopefully give you some advices what to do and what not to, what not to do. So there are data thefts, protocol errors, implementation errors, hardware attacks, political attacks, and uh, we will go one after each other. So, data theft. This is nothing new. You probably know that in 2011, Mt. Gox exchange was hacked uh, via security breach. Half a million bitcoins were stolen. Then, BTCE 2012, Poloniex 2014, BitPay. There was uh, uh, something interesting about this attack that it was not like a regular security breach. It was a social engineering fraud when uh, somebody pretended to be a chief, chief finance officer of the company and he wrote to the CEO, please uh, top up our hot wallet. This is the address and he happily did that. But it's uh, also something like a security breach. Uh, and Bitfinex uh, 2016. Uh, what's, uh, what these things have common is that they really are not tied to just the crypto space. Like this kind of attacks happen outside of the crypto space as well. So that's why I'm, I'm not going to go in further. I will focus on uh, attacks that are uh, mostly uh, just specif specific for crypto space. But I will give you some uh, takeaways anyway. Uh, for each uh, section, there will be two sets of takeaways. If you are a developer of such thing, there is one set, and if you are a user of such thing, there is another set. So if you are developing a service, pl please use secure operating systems. I don't think that needs any further comment. Uh, use second factor authentication for accessing your infrastructure. That's very important because uh, attackers can uh, deploy codes without you knowing it, and that's a big problem for your user, of course. Then provide second factor authentication also for your users so they can access uh, your service securely. SMS is not a second factor authentication because you uh, you can get easily hacked when a uh, mobile operator collaborates or is uh, attacked on the really low level of, uh, of this uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> and uh, also it's quite good to hold uh, regular meetings in your company to challenge your security protocols, like meet and have a discussion like, is everything we do like correct? Like, isn't there any possibility? And it has proven to be a really good thing to uh, one thing is to create some security protocol, but then you have to constantly challenge it yourself, like if it's still good. And also, I think there's a good point, and it, nobody really talks about it. Socialize with your coworkers, so we will know them better. Like if if a CFO of your company sends you an email, hey, please do this, and you know him like really well, and you are like, ah, it's probably not him. Like what he's doing. So, uh, trust is fine, but if you exactly know what the other person does, it's even better. And for users, 
So use services that follow these security practices and others. Uh, use these security features. If they are provided by the services, then use it. Uh, read blogs, follow the ecosystem, and educate yourself so you'll know which service is good or bad. Then we have uh, protocol errors. Uh, these are errors in design of the cryptographical protocol. And uh, they are mostly logical errors by omission. Like the designer of the protocol haven't thought about that particular eventuality that hackers uh, came up with and exploited. Uh, there is a problem that these errors are not tied to a particular implementation and uh, impact all clients that implement this protocol because they are just doing what the protocol does. One good example is transaction malleability. It uh, was a big thing like t t two or three years ago. So how does it work? Transaction ID is a hash of the transaction, including the transaction signatures. But for every ECDSA signature, which is a tuple of two numbers, R and S, the signature R minus S is also valid. It's the same signature, but it's a different, uh, it's a different number, and this number has a different representation. Also, uh, if you pad these uh, two values uh, from left with zeros, the value doesn't change, but the representation in the computer changes. Like we. It, it's no difference if I give you four apples or zero, 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 four apples. So the transactions with the same meaning have different IDs. They have uh, basically the same signatures and same, the content is the same, but uh, this signature have different representation in the computer, so transaction ID is different. And this can lead to double spends. Like one part of the network thinks that uh, this hasn't been spent because it sees a different transaction ID. Uh, so this was solved uh, by tightening the rules for S. So uh, the other uh, minus S signature was no valid anymore. And also we use uh, canonical there encoding. So there is a rule like if number starts with numbers uh, with several zeros, then it's not a valid number because they are really not needed there. Then we have implementation errors. So these are errors in implementing the protocol. And this usually affect only one implementation. But we have open source today. And open source really encourages code reuse. So usually you have like open source library that is used in lots of projects. So even if one implementation is affected, all these projects that use this library are affected as well. And also uh, this uh, open source encourages code reuse also between languages. For example, if I am writing uh, some Python code and I found a JavaScript version on Stack Overflow, I will just rewrite it blindly. And uh, that's, of course, not very good because I also copy not only the code, but also this implementation error. So that's what I said. Uh, there are a couple of really nice examples. Well, nice for us, but not nice for people uh, that uh, encounter them. So first of them is black hole. Uh, basically, coins are sent to destinations where no one can spend them from. Uh, if you are using uh, Unix, then dev null is something uh, that is uh, being compared to. So who recognizes this address? <laughs> OK, only one. So that's address uh, in Bitcoin address that has like empty pub key hash. Uh, in Bitcoin, you have a public key, and then you hash it, and then you convert this hash to address. If something fails in the process, like for example, hash function says like, uh, I cannot do this, do this, it returns zeros, but if you don't check for the error code and work with the result again, we will end up with this address. So how, uh, how much Bitcoins are on this address today? What do you think? <laughs> no, 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 it's not 2,000, but it's 60 Bitcoins, so it's quarter of a million of dollars. And it was happening all over the years, people sending Bitcoins there by accident, because that it was not their fault, but the implementation fault of the software they were using. A similar 
case is this address. And does someone recognize this one? So it's a similar story. If you have a public key of zero, which is not a valid public key, it probably some ECDC library told like uh, there was an error and I'm returning zero. And if you hash it and convert it to address, you get this address. And there are like four bitcoins today. But it has a lo lots of transactions. I think even more than the first one. <clears throat> Then there are weak random number generators. So if you are doing ECDCA signatures, it needs a strong random number to create a signature, uh, because it's, that's how it was designed. But if you have two different messages, and you are assigning them with the same private key, and for some reason, the random generator always gives you the same number, uh, then your private key is compromised just, just by signing two different messages with the same key and same random number. By the way, this is how PlayStation 3 was hacked, because they had a weak number generator and they were signing uh, games. So there were a lot of signatures out in the world, and they were able to perform this hack. Uh, but this will not happen because the space is just too big, right? Well, PlayStation has shown that it's not too big if you have a weak random generator. But we are talking about crypto space. And unfortunately, exactly the same thing happened in Android in 2013. The interesting thing was that uh, the author of the Bitcoin uh, library for Android, they decided not to use their own random generator, but used the secure random generator from Android, which turned out that it was not so secure. So uh, I think uh, all four Bitcoin wallets for Android at that time were affected, and around 60 Bitcoins were reported stolen at that time. Uh, then the smart people came with uh, something that's called RFC 6979, deterministic signatures. And what they do is uh, they say, let's not generate a random number k. But let's create a function that takes a message and a private or secret key and generates a random number from these two. And this, this basically uh, guarantees that you cannot generate same random number for different messages when the same private key is used. So this we used uh, immediately in Trezor since the beginning, not only because of the Android uh, fail, but we are unit testing uh, our crypto library from top to bottom. And unit testing is really impossible when signatures always keep changing. Like you will give the same input, like same private key and same message, and it always uh, returns a different signature. So that's why we uh, decided to use the deterministic ones. And suddenly all the ECDSA crypto code was testable. But then, even after uh, Trezor was out, and everybody uh, knew that RFC 6979 is the way to go, Bitcoin JS was affected. And uh, uh, some other projects like Counterparty or even Blockchain Info were using this library, so they had the same problem. And uh, the problem with this is everyone can see that you messed up because the signatures are, are public in the blockchain. So I can just look into the blockchain and wait until you make a mistake. And there were some people in the world that were doing this. And one of them was Jochen, sitting somewhere there. And uh, what he did, he preemptively swept such coins from the black blockchain info and store them in Trezor, and then send this picture to blockchain and to, to affected uh, people. Like, he didn't know who they were, and said, like, your bitcoins are in this Trezor, and if you prove the ownership of that affected address and give me a new one, I will send them back. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that was our first uh, contact with Jochen, and we've been collaborating happily ever since. He's doing a lot of stuff for Trezor, like you will see on the next uh, slides. 
But uh, there was one particular company that thought, like, you can't have weak random number generator if you don't have any. So uh, what they did is, uh, yeah, it was a blockchain again. So they had an Android wallet, and they said, what if we used, uh, uh, spoiler alert, so I will get back to this. So what we, we use this web service, uh, random.org API, which generates random numbers. So we don't have to implement any, and we are safe because random work, like, pfft. It's very, very safe. But what happened is they switched to HTTPS, and suddenly this HTTP URL started to return this. <laughs> <laughs> and what they did, like they always just hashed the response and used that to generate address. So suddenly, all requests were uh, hashed to the same uh, data, and th when the, you converted this hash to the address, it was this. There were like 45 bitcoins on this address. Of course, they were like immediately swept uh, away. And uh, a lot of, basically, a lot of people suddenly s saw a new address in their wallet, which was exactly like this. <clears throat> so uh, then there is... Uh, Another group of implementation errors which were introduced in Bitcoin Unlimited. And they had uh, some memory leaks triggered by specially crafted user inputs or transactions. So I could create a transaction which was broadcasted to the network. And when it hit the Bitcoin Unlimited node, uh, it started to eat a lot of memory. And then the, the kernel says, like, hey, bad Bitcoin Unlimited, you use a lot of memory. I'm going to kill you. So uh, that was a problem. And another problem a couple of weeks later was uh, discovered that there were so-called reachable asserts, uh, again, uh, by specially crafted user inputs. So let me tell you a little bit about how that works. So in some programming languages, like for example Python or C, there is a thing called assert. And basically a programmer says, like, this condition, which I write here, like for example, block size is always less than one megabyte, should be always true. And if it's not true, so the assert is like broken, just don't continue and abort the whole process. Uh, this code, uh, this assert is usually used in uh, development build, but it really makes sense to use it for production build of such a system like Bitcoin as well, because you don't want to have code which uh, uses the data that a programmer didn't really anticipate it. So it's uh, probably better to just shut down the node than to keep it running. If you have a game, it's a little bit different. Like, if there is a broken texture, you can still finish the level and then restart the game. It's not a problem. But for, for Bitcoin, you don't want to keep it running if, if there is some inconsistency. So... But uh, even if you are using these asserts in production code, there should not be like a path from user-defined input how to trigger this condition. And that's what uh, was possible in Bitcoin Unlimited. Again, some hackers, uh, they created special transactions, which after processing trigger this path. And you can see there is the graph of the uh, node count. So I think that this first fall was this memory leak I was talking about, and these two falls, uh, it was like from 700 nodes to almost uh, almost 200. So like two thirds of the network were just down because of that uh, particular hack. So then we have smart contracts. Uh, you probably knew about uh, parity multisig problem. Parity is a client for for uh, Ethereum, and they had implemented a multi-signature contract, but there was an error. You probably also know about the DAO. I will not go into the details because it's like maybe topic for a separate talk, but there is a nice write-up by Vitalik here about how uh, we should really rethink smart co smart contract security. And uh, the code is law, unless it's not. So 
from for some some problems they decided just to somehow roll back the actions uh, i don't really want to go into the politics but uh, study it is a fine reading <clears throat> so some takeaways if you are a developer, always peer review your, your code. Don't blindly copy paste the code unless you understand it first. Don't use uh, languages which make it easy to introduce bugs. So PHP, JavaScript, C, and basically every other language. Don't use them. <laughs> but if you have to, follow the best practices. So uh, for some languages like Perl or JavaScript, you can enable strict mode, uh, comment code, so others uh, have a bigger chance to understand in the code review. And if you are users, avoid using solutions with no sh or short or bad records. So you cannot judge uh, how, what's the quality of the code. Uh, look how active is the developer community around the project. Because it's very act if it's very active, then probably the implementation's error are, uh, I'm not saying they are not there, but there is a high chance they were fixed. And also look how developers react to constructive criticism. Like if, you are, if they are in denial, then run away. <laughs> and there is another section, uh, uh, hardware attacks. So, uh, you can have get a good protocol and its flawless implementation, but there are hackers that are still able to attack the underlying hardware, which is performing this code. And uh, if they understand it very well, they can make it perform what they want, not what you want. Uh, Trezor is open source, both hardware and uh, software. And because it's uh, open, it attracts uh, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, hackers. Not only the good ones, but also the bad ones. Uh, the good thing is that uh, Whitehead uh, good ones are winning. So we received uh, some uh, security uh, reports in the past, and uh, we were working with the reporter and the wider community to fix them. Uh, I don't want to sound, of course, that uh, only Trezor is affected. There are a lot of other security solutions like Intel SGX uh, and Secure Elements, which also they have their flaws. But I'm not really interested in uh, their flaws because they are closed and I cannot fix them anyway. So uh, I'm, what I will give you there will be a couple of examples of how we found out about the issues and how we fixed them, because that's actually doable with open design like Trezor. So what you can do is side channels analysis. Uh, again, it was done uh, by Jochen in 2015. And uh, when he was reading the code, he realized it's uh, not performing in constant time. So it, what, is, what, it, what it does mean? is that if you have a zero in a private key somewhere, uh, it skips uh, some portion of the code, and if there is one, it performs it, and it, uh, it's uh, basically leaking some private data by how long is the code running and how uh, much power does it use. And this was used, uh, this was fixed in software by using constant time operations. So basically, you go through the code and every, on every place where this is happening, you just replace it. And how do you can replace it? It's being done like this. If there is a zero uh, in some bit, you still perform the operation, but then you discard the result. So the attacker really doesn't know if there was, was a zero or not because the code always uh, runs. <clears throat> and also, uh, PIN is asked before any operation with secret data. So, uh, if you uh, would like to perform side channel analysis, you would need to know the PIN first, and then it's, it's a problem because uh, <clears throat> it's not like just some random hacker uh, that found Trezor on the street. Uh, this was his... Uh, uh, tool, it, uh, it's an oscilloscope, and he attached to the USB cable and was able to measure the power consumption. It's, and this is uh, written on his blog, like you could see like which operation takes how much time in, in, uh, 
in uh, this time time domain. Okay, so then there is a glitching. Uh, there was a talk at DEF CON this year by Josh Dutko, and uh, what he was studying was a VCC glitching. So basically, uh, basically what you do is uh, you you. Uh, identify some critical operations, like writing the wrong pin num number uh, twice in the flash. And when this is about to happen, you decrease the voltage on the microcontroller, so it's not able to perform the write, but it's still enough voltage uh, so it doesn't shut down. And this is called VCC glitching. So basically, you make a uh, microcontroller to skim, skip some, some operations, which are critical, because it doesn't have uh, enough power. And there are various ways how to fix that. So there is uh, something called brown out detection. So there is a part of the microcontroller controller that is watching the voltage. And if voltage goes under some value, then it just shuts down the processor. And also, uh, you can check for every critical operation if it really happens. So if you are writing this uh, wrong try uh, number in, uh, on the flash, you write it and you wait after it has been written. You, so you constantly keep asking flash, like, are you done? Are you done? Are you done? And even uh, you are not going uh, further until it's not written. And then you again check, like, is there a really increased number written there? So we read it back. And if it's, there is a mismatch, you just say, ah, this, uh, there's something really fishy going on. <clears throat> and there is another group of attacks called clock glitching. And uh, basically, uh, there is on microcontroller, there is a, usually an, some external crystal which ticks at some frequency. So, uh, so microcontroller can uh, work with uh, USB and other uh, peripherals which require high precision. And uh, <clears throat> what you can do is somehow uh, glitch this clock again, so uh, uh, like in a similar fashion. So uh, microcontroller skips some instructions, but uh, doesn't shut down completely. I will show some example. And this uh, can be avoided by enabling clock security system. So, so again, in microcontroller, there is a chip which is always watching at the frequency of this external crystal. And if it goes, uh, uh, if it's not like 8 megahertz like it should be, but I don't know, half a percent bigger or smaller, then it again, it shuts down the microcontroller. <clears throat> So uh, this is the tool called uh, Chip Whisperer, which is able to perform such attacks. There is an FPGA here. There is your testing uh, microcontroller here. So imagine this part is off, and uh, you will attach a Trezor with microcontroller. And there is a library on the Chip Whisperer website which says, uh, like, if I want to make uh, this microcontroller to skip seven instructions perform this VCC or clock glitch, and it will jump seven instructions, for example. So what Josh was trying to do is to perform so-called out-of-loop glitch. So basically, when Trezor is waiting uh, several seconds, because uh, between uh, pin entries, uh, we, we wait for some time if, if, you, if you manage to mess up. So uh, let, this is the code that waits for a couple of seconds until it continues. Frag is the frequency of the processor, basically. Uh, and uh, this is the number of seconds you want to wait. So we multiply the processor frequency with the seconds, and you perform this infinite loop. And if you are able to glitch this, so uh, just uh, skip one instruction that goes at the beginning of the loop. You can ba basically glitch out of this loop completely, basically eliminating the delay. But what Josh found out that we used this code, so we, uh, we have this inner loop, which waits for one second, and we have this outer loop, which waits for uh, seconds. seconds. 
and it's much harder to jump out of two loops at once. And you can do this kind of uh, optimizations, or it's not really optimization, it's, it's the opposite thing. You make the core uh, code uh, more complicated, but for, for a very good reason. So, uh, I wanted to mention uh, some political attacks. Da -da 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 -da. You probably know uh, a lot about this, but I don't have a lot of time. So, uh, just in a nutshell, there are always some group which are trying to persuade uh, you that this their version of Bitcoin is better than the others. They usually use the argument, uh, we have bigger blocks, so there is a big, uh, bigger uh, throughput of the transactions. Uh, again, uh, there is a lot of things that can be said about this. Um, if you want to talk, uh, just grab me outside uh, and we can talk. So just some main takeaways, so stay vigilant, Educate yourself. Don't be afraid to ask. Like, there are always people that are uh, smarter than you, and they don't really uh, behave like assholes. <laughs> so don't be afraid to ask. You might learn something. And also, always analyze other uh, people's thoughts before you adopt them. So you will learn if that's really making sense. So, so don't be don't be a sheep. So uh, this has been my talk. Uh, this is my Twitter account, my email, and probably a lot of people were thinking that this will be a Trezor 2 talk, but there are a lot of people around the Congress from Satoshi Labs, so you can ask them uh, about Trezor. They have some devices here. Uh, you can have a look, and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, material written about Trezor on our blog, and it will be updated uh, more and more uh, until the Trezor is released, which is, will be probably the first question we'll ask now. So it's going to be released uh, uh, in, well, not in two weeks, but uh, this year, end of this year. So thank you, and I'm... Um, <clears throat> yeah. so. mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, mm -hmm. We have time for a few questions, so please uh, raise your hand and I will remember the, uh, the, the order and I will come to you. Please wait. Uh, for the mic with your question. But before that, is uh, Jochen sitting here? If so, could you stand up, please? <laughs> so please, applause for this great guy as well. <laughs> so first question, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Child paid pays for parent, replaced by fee and support for Monero. What are the timelines? So, eta, eta, eta. So, uh, timeline for uh, replaced by fee and child pays for parent is soon. Like Carol, who is sitting there and laughing, has been working on uh, improving the send dialog for a couple of uh, weeks and months already, but he got derail derailed because of some other stuff like Bitcoin Cash and others. So uh, it's really in the queue. I maybe it was already merged, but it's like coming really, really soon. And Monero, uh, it's. Uh, we are working on Monero right now, but we, or at least that's my personal opinion, we don't, uh, uh, I don't want to go on the internet and say I'm working, or our, me, our, my company is working on Monero, because then people are asking like, eta, 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 eta. So uh, we are working on it, and once it's finished, then it's finished. We are definitely not ignoring it, but uh, yeah, that's it. I don't have ETA, so that's why I'm not saying we are working on it. There are some challenges. Uh, I know there are a lot of Monero people here, 
just come to me and I will um, I will I will uh, contact or I will give a contact to a person who's uh, probably he already contacted you who is working on that mm -hmm. other questions okay, so I will use time for my question so mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us maybe some of the discussions behind the scenes in, in Satoshi Labs regarding the security features in, in Trezor? Like, for example, yesterday we, we discussed the thing about mm -hmm. the mnemonic features. Okay, so the, the question was like, what are the some things we are cooking and are not well known yet? Or <laughs> Uh, can you can you rephrase the question? Yeah, so I will like what are the uh, discussions that mm -hmm. even in such a relatively small team mm -hmm. you have different uh, uh, like different opinions on the same thing? Ah, okay. So uh, we we are trying to come up with a different uh, mnemonic scheme because the current one. Uh, which uh, I implemented with Slash uh, three or four years ago has some flaws, and uh, st still I think it's a good good thing to do because uh, every basically every wallet now using that is using that, and so they are interoperable. But uh, we would like to add some more features in it, and one of the features that uh, is really critical for me is this uh, Shamir secret uh, splitting. So basically, uh, you, during the initialization of the device, it uh, will already give you like several sets of mnemonics you could back up. And uh, it's really hard to uh, do it right, because uh, I don't want to mm, screw that, because if you uh, if you mess up with uh, one mnemonic, then it's a problem. But if you mess up with this multi-signature scheme, that it can be even bigger problem because you will uh, recognize it just when it happens. And uh, there are a lot of uh, discussions, uh, both public and private, and various groups of people want to put different stuff there. Like, for example, SPV implementers of wallets, they want to have a birthday in it. So uh, they really want to know from which point of time they need to scan the blockchain, so they don't want to scan the whole thing. And uh, some other people just don't want to have birthday in it because they are leaking uh, some info which probably might or might not be shared with the others so there are a lot of a uh, uh, lot of points to make during this uh, standards uh, creation process <clears throat> sorry wait for the mic please yeah. Is there a BIP number for this? Uh, there's not a BIP number yet. Uh, I'm discussing with uh, some of the wallet uh, implementers first to get some, something at least like a rough idea, and then we will ask for, uh, for a BIP number. <clears throat> Another question? Do we have other questions? So you are, of course, oh, we have. All right. Uh, <laughs> so my question is: uh, You say that people make pro uh, make mistakes when implementing pr uh, protocols and things like that. So is there something like OWASP for blockchain? Uh, so the question was: Ah, my port is. Ah, so maybe it's me who is making the. Do you hear me? Uh, so the question was, uh, there might be some errors introduced by protocols, and the, whether there are there is some group of people like OWASP who are working on. Uh, so ah, okay. the question if if the quest, if there is something like OWASP is for mm -hmm. web application, if there is something mm -hmm. similar in the world of cryptocurrencies, right? 
yeah. well, for for Bitcoin, obviously there is this uh, Bit Bitcoin improvement proposal process. So there is a there is a GitHub where these standards are being discussed and uh, later implemented. For other cryptocurrencies, I don't know, but I would expect they have a similar process like this. And when it comes to like protocols, like even uh, abstract protocol, not to tied to some uh, some uh, uh, particular uh, cryptocurrency, uh, I know there at least there are some working groups in uh, W3C uh, and also IETF. And, uh, for example, in IETF, there is a working group which is trying to standardize uh, so-called uh, cosigners or aggre uh, signature aggregates. So if you have like a several uh, signatures signed by several keys, uh, you can uh, um, perform an operation which is able to create one public key and one signature uh, which uh, which does the same thing as a group of uh, signature and group of uh, uh, of public keys, and this process also takes time. I I'm, don't know a lot of about the details, but my really uh, uh, outsider's view is that these standards take like 10, 10, uh, 10 years or even more, and. I, I don't think that's really uh, applicable to this uh, kind of uh, cryptocurrency world. But of course, uh, it's, it has been shown, like uh, in my slides as well, if, if you don't pay a lot of attention to this protocol process, you can introduce bugs which are really hard to be spotted uh, until they are really uh, discovered in production, and then it's usually really late. So, I don't know of any super body in crypto space, but W3C and IETF are working on some uh, cryptographical standards which, which can be applied in crypto space uh, or in cryptocurrency space as well. <clears throat> we have time for one more question. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Have you got any thoughts about uh, scenarios when uh, there will be no uh, proper replay protection during the 2x hard fork? Well, uh, there, there are some ways how to split coins even if there is no proper replay protection. And it's uh, one trick is to use uh, lock time where you basically say uh, this transaction cannot be spent before block uh, ABC and uh, you submit, uh, you create a transaction with this lock time and uh, if one, one blockchain is in advance of another, you, you use this higher number so it can be mined only on one blockchain. And once, uh, if it's mined there, you will create a double spend transaction on the first uh, chain, which will send it to another address. But that, again, it's, it's doable, but it's not like uh, super easy for regular people. So if there was a proper replay protection, strong one, it would be much easier. Like Bitcoin Cash, they implemented this strong replay protection a couple of days before the fork, and it was not uh, the fork was not flawless, but at least there was not a problem with that. So there are a couple of uh, ways how to do it, but again, I don't want to say like we do it it uh, that way because maybe tomorrow they will create a strong replay protection, and again, this statement would be like of no use anyway. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank and you very much for your questions, for your answers, and mm -hmm. in the first place for your mm -hmm. interesting talk. Yeah. Mm. yeah.